Okay, uh, it's 6 1 guys, we will start quickly. So, firstly, uh, good evening, welcome back, scholars, welcome back to your own channel. And yes, so today, since it's uh, Saturday, we have a class for standard 11th. So, with that, I just wanted to say that with the last class, we finished uh, chapter uh, 7, which is changing cultural traditions right and we've also done a quiz on that it went pretty well so here we are moving on to the next chapter which is chapter 9 titled as the industrial revolution right so basically what we're doing with starting this chapter is we are entering the 17th, 17th and 18th century in the last chapter we've discussed about 15th 16th so from there we're moving a little forward in the timeline where we'll be start where we'll start to talk about the changes that are happening in the 17th 18th century right so today is part one of the chapter i'm hoping we'll take like four to uh, three to four classes to finish this but yeah let's start it with part one today yeah okay um a couple of you are already here kiran is here hi kiran good evening uh ayushi is back hi ayushi Okay, so I'll quickly do the introductory part. I'm hoping in the meantime, others will join also. Uh, Radha is also back. Hi, Radha. <laughs> no problem, Aisha. You can like all the, always go back and look at the lectures if you have missed any. But since you're now here anyways for live thing, I'm glad you're here. Okay, uh, Murari is also here with us. Hi, Murari. Okay, so cool. Just give me like two, three minutes. We'll dive straight into the topic in two, three minutes, right? Till then I'll do the introductory part. Uh, okay, so a little bit about myself, a daily ritual. My name is Nikita, as most of y'all already know, and I'm the history educator here at an Academy Scholars channel. I take classes for both standard 11th and 12th. And about my educational qualifications, I have graduated from Ashoka University with a bachelor's degree. I have a major in history and a minor in political science. Uh, so we'll just quickly go through some of an Academy's plus features. Uh, the first thing is you can actually sit at your own houses and learn live from the comfort of your own houses. Um, th and these courses are taught by top educators of India. All of them are available on one single platform and there's unlimited access to all of these courses. Then there are regular doubt clearing sessions, answer writing sessions, uh, practice tests and live test series. Along with that, there's also exhaustive coverage of syllabus by the educators on an Academy Plus platform. There's mentorship provided, there is guidance provided, along with access to study materials, which are in the form of PDF. So when it comes to an Academy Plus pricing, we actually have six different ranges of subscriptions, starting from six months to almost 24 months. The prices you see here are the actual prices. But if you use the code, which is TUM10, you'll be basically getting a 10% off. And these are the post discounted prices. Um, and when it comes to Iconic, there's personal mentorship, live doubt solving sessions, weekly reports, parent connect, and also study planners. Iconic pricing is also the same. On the left side are the actual prices. After using the code, these are the post discounted prices. And nextly, there's something called as an Academy's Combat Scholarship Test, which most of you all know it's a scholarship test. Uh, the question here is as such that you'll be given 30 questions to answer in 60 minutes. The test is available in both English and Hindi. So I highly recommend you all to enroll yourselves, take part in the quiz. It's highly beneficial. Okay, so that's a little pitch we had for today. <laughs> okay, Aishi, so Ashoka University is basically um, in Delhi NCR itself. But to be very specific, it comes under Sonipat region of Haryana. 
so it's a liberal arts college so there you don't have like a uh, ba program ba honors and stuff like that instead of that we have something called as majors and minors major is like the subject which which is your primary subject right somewhere equivalent to honors degree and a minor is the second subject you have selected like a secondary form of thing yeah it, it's kind of difficult to explain but like that that's what a liberal arts education is i mean it's pretty easy <laughs> Okay uh Cool so with that I think we can quickly start uh, the chapter which is um uh, Oh uh I, okay that that's no that's not a problem rather it's totally fine I mean it's pretty much understandable uh, but in case you're facing any difficulties in understanding my way of teaching uh i'm always here to like repeat it twice or probably you can ask me questions and and then i'll answer them anything works according to your convenience but um yeah i'm hoping you'll understand the sessions okay so we are basically talking about industrial revolution this is that one term which we have heard like thousands and thousands of times while growing up while doing social studies till your 10th standard like it, it the word just comes repeatedly right randomly somewhere in textbooks and especially when we're talking about 17th and 18th century world right so that is the same topic which we're going to discuss in detail right now yeah like what led to this revolution what are the consequences of this revolution what happened during it so we'll be looking at all of that stuff So first let's look at the time frame as in when did this revolution exactly take place the answer to that is 1780s till 1850s so it's not something which happened in one year right no it's not one year or two years revolution in fact it happens for almost so many decades right so this particular industrial revolution which we are interested in is called as first industrial revolution because there's something second also but we are more interested in the first one so this first one actually started in 1780s and went all t- went on till 1850s right so we'll only be talking about this one but just to give you like a brief idea as to what the second one is and where did this happen So the second one actually started right after 1850 right right after the first one ended second one began So the difference between first and second is the first industrial revolution was mainly categorized by um iron industries uh, steel industries coal industries um textile industries right but when it comes to second it was majorly uh, chemical and electrical industries right so that's the major difference chemical and electrical took major part of the second revolution and also the place is different right this revolution is no more happening in britain but instead britain almost lost its uh, world power but and in place of britain germany and usa took over right so the key differences you have to remember is first industrial revolution 1780s to 1850s second one started from 1850 the second difference first industrial revolution majorly regarding coal industries and textile industries but the second one is chemical and e- chemical and electrical industries the third one the third difference is the first industrial revolution happened in britain whereas the second industrial revolution happened in germany and usa right so like make a table for yourself like differentiating three different things yeah so that will be much easier so again these points are important that's why i'm stressing a lot on that please make a table for yourself it will be very uh, beneficial okay um dheeraj is here with us hi dheeraj uh yeah so now going back to the first one again now leave the second one we're not going to talk about the second one anymore 
right so whatever i'll be talking from here is only about the first industrial revolution so obviously because it's happening in britain almost every individual or every person in britain experienced this or was a victim of this they were affected in some sort of way right uh in the later decades somehow this same industrial revolution spread to other european continents like to the far east and all that stuff but the starting point for this is britain right so um these were to have a major impact on the society right because everything around you is changing right economy is changing machines are changing society is also changing in some sort of way agricultural production is changing when so many things are changing around you obviously you are bound to have an impact right and economies will definitely be altered of britain yeah and when it slowly um shifts to other part of the world the rest of the world will also be affected in the same manner right so so what like is there any characteristics that we can attribute to this particular industrial revolution uh yes there is definitely one so if anybody asks you what are the characteristics of the first industrial revolution the quick answer is it is strongly associated with new machinery and technology this is the answer what is the characteristic it's characterized by new machinery and technologies right so that's the first slide um in case any questions you all have just let me know in the chat box before we move on to the second okay um uh, chanchal is here with us hi chanchal good evening uh yes chanchal you can definitely ask just like type down your question and post it in the chat box you don't need to like ask permission just whenever you have questions put them down Uh, just keep typing in the meanwhile i'll make another point from the next slide uh i see i don't have a personal telegram channel uh, telegram id um, but there's always a common one called scholars um, which the link you already have but i don't have any personal one i see uh you want notes for this chapter i mean i can share it on the scholars group itself you could access it from there if that's fine but just give me time till the chapter is over right once the chapter is over then probably i can provide you notes with that yes <laughs> chanchal the thing is i don't know to speak hindi right so obviously like explanation is like a very far away thing but the basic hindi also i can't speak so i don't think your request is possible chanchal i'm sorry about that uh okay um i'll start with the next slide uh we were basically talking about the characteristics which is machinery and technology so what like what is the use of machinery and technology obviously if there are some sort of machines and if they are very very effective which means that a particular good will be produced very quickly matlab it doesn't need so much of time and secondly so much of quantity can be produced within the same period within the same time right so let's take an example um let's say there are hand looms and handicraft industry they're making some sort of toys or something for kids so when you're actually like doing it with the hand like it's like a handmade toy handicrafts and hand looms are used in that case probably it might take 10 days for you to make one toy but in this but at the same time if you're using machines and uh, technology and stuff you could in the same time like in the same 10 days not just one but probably you can make 10 more toys 
right so which means quantity is increasing the number of goods are increasing time is also becoming lesser to to manufacture a particular good so both ways it's helping right so that is why technology was um technology has played a very important role during industrial revolution uh yes i can understand hindi aishi but i don't know to talk uh okay uh thanks chanchal and aishi for understanding uh we'll go ahead cool so the chapter that we'll be talking in the next couple of sessions in 3 4 sessions will be basically talking about cotton and iron industries because they were dominating during that period so cotton and iron very very important please remember these two things and we'll also be talking about steam technology right like with the use of steam there are so many things that were invented for example steam engine very uh, popular invention so it's not just with the engines but steam as a source of power have been used very widely throughout the britain yeah especially in british industries right and um in in what else did the steam help right firstly it's in engines secondly it facilitated a faster means of transportation and by that i not only mean railways but i'm also referring to ships right but there were steam ships as well which could like navigate faster through the water right so steam was useful both for waterways and uh, railways so nextly but who are these people um, that are making use of these changes right or who are these people who are benefiting from these changes and who are these people who are inventing these right so the answers to all of these questions lie uh, has two answers basically number one either the person has to be like super rich like personally very wealthy because only then he'll have the money to invest in something and can become a businessman right or the second answer is that man is a very intellectual person and he has some sort of basic knowledge in physics and chemistry or like sciences basically otherwise how will he invent all of this stuff right so it has to be either two of these explanations wealthy or intellectually sound yeah so that's how all of these inventions came into being because of the efforts of the man it just didn't appear naturally right person had to put in some sort of effort and um that is when inventions come up yeah uh okay uh i'll quickly move on to the next slide guys at you you'll have questions at any point of time please uh, feel free to stop me and we can talk about it okay um we're talking about industrialization industrial revolution technology machinery and all that stuff but is everybody benefiting equally out of it like we're talking about the consequences right is everybody reaping the same benefits or does there exist some kind of inequality uh the answer is there there definitely was some sort of inequality because in order to invest in machines and use technology firstly you need to be rich because machine is not a cheap thing it's very very expensive so for you to buy a machine in the first place it's expensive which means poor people def can definitely not afford the machine right so what is happening here rich people are investing they are buying machines they are producing goods they are making so much money out of it and becoming even richer on the other hand poor people are losing their jobs firstly because their whatever job they have to do is being replaced by the machines now obviously right like what what do we mean by machines are replacing men 
men are losing their jobs because all of their work is being done by the machines now so firstly there's no employment and even there is if and even if there is some sort of meager employment it doesn't pay well right working conditions are very very horrible like no sanit proper sanitations no clean environment um wages are very very low working hours are also very high like you have to work like 15 16 hours a day right so on one side the richer people are benefiting but on the other side poorer people are even becoming poorer yeah so it had like a double effect it's not always a positive thing right okay so now we're looking at poor people obviously not satisfied with whatever is happening do you think they'll be quiet no right because they want their rights they want their freedom so obviously they took to streets they started protesting saying whatever is happening we don't agree with it it's so bad you know like at least facilitate some sort of working conditions for us and they started protesting and asking the government which is the monarchy at that time in britain to formulate and implement some laws regarding the labor which is probably 8 uh, hours of work a day and not even a single minute more than that right and secondly they were also demanding for minimum wages yeah like payers on a monthly basis or payers on a weekly basis or even sometimes hourly basis but pay us a considerable amount so that we can have a dignified life right so these are all the demands that the poor people were making uh, in front of the government to enact some laws right so um yeah so that's the basic intro of this chapter right now we'll look at who who actually coined this term industrial revolution like who invented this particular term and who all used it later on right for the first time it was used by uh, two european scholars these people are important so please pay uh, a little more attention the first is george michelet right so this george michelet was actually a french man like a french scholar and then we also have frederick engels a very very famous uh, personality he is actually a german so these two people are actually the first to use the term industrial revolution and later on it was used by a english philosopher and an economist called as arnold toynbee right so what are the names important here for us the first is george michelet he is a french scholar the second is frederick engels he is a german the spellings are here guys please refer to them if you are not able to grasp the spelling the third is arnold toynbee who is a english philosopher cum economist right so these three people are important at some point of times while they are writing and uh, producing scholarly work they have used this term industrial revolution right okay so um, the period where actually toynbee was alive like or toynbee was writing these scholarly works toynbee is the third name we have seen right he's an english philosopher cum economist so when actually toynbee was alive and writing all of these scholarly works the king who was ruling over england or that at that time called as britain was george the 3 right george the 3 was the ruler and since toynbee is a philosopher and also an economist his major job was to give lectures at some sort of universities and especially oxford university right so he he gives like various lectures lectures on the administrative style of george the 3 lectures on uh, economy lectures on philosophy like different things right so whatever he was lecturing during his lifetime they were never published right be it articles be it his interviews be it his uh, books that he has written nothing nothing have been produced while 
published when he was alive but when he died like some for un- some for some unfortunate reasons reasons his death was an untimely death but once he died um, in the year 1884 his work was published in the form of a book right and that book was called as lectures on the industrial revolution in england popular addresses notes and other fragments this is the title of the book that was published after his death right so what all he lectured during his lifetime all of them were compiled together and published in the form of this book right so um yeah um so by now most of the people have read by the end of 19th century because scholars were there like scholars kept reading toynbee's book and they kind of agreed with toynbee to whatever he was saying right we have ashton we have mantox we have a uh, hobsbawm the spellings are here all of these are great historians in the 19th and 20th centuries they completely agreed with toynbee regarding whatever he was saying right so their philosophies basically match so um that's that and coming to the economic growth or like what exactly was happening from 1780s to 1820s there was rapid economic growth and from where is this economic growth coming we actually have uh, five sectors from where it's coming the first is the rise in cotton and iron industries right the second is coal mining then we have buildings of roads then we have buildings of canals and eventually foreign trade right so these five or six things are actually contributing a lot to the economic growth of britain in these four decades yes so uh um, then we then also we have ashton the same person we referred to above he celebrated the industrial revolution when england was swept by a wave of gadgets again by gadgets i don't mean present day like phones laptops ipods and stuff but there were some sort of gadgets back in those times also so when england was actually experiencing the invention of these gadgets ashton actually started celebrating industrial revolution right so celebrating matlab i mean he was in total praise of industrial revolution like he's just so proud about it yeah okay any questions still here because from the next slide we'll be talking like about a sub theme this has been like the ba- major uh, intro to this chapter right okay uh aishi we started at 6 as usual i think we'll be able to finish by like 7 or 7:10 ish okay um guys if there are no questions probably i can go ahead okay i don't think there are any cool so the next sub theme we'll be exploring is why britain right like by this what i basically mean is there are so many countries in this world but why did industrialization originate in britain what is so special about britain right we do have a definite answer for it in fact not just one explanation but we have different sort of explanations and it is the cumulative effect of all of these reasons which gave rise to the industrial revolution in britain right so we'll look at all of those factors one by one Britain was the first country to experience modern industrialization established point industrial revolution but why number 1 it can be attributed to the political stability that has been there in britain for a really long time for almost like a century now because right from the 17th century itself britain was very very politically stable yeah and it's not just one country anymore in fact england wales scotland and some parts of ireland also yeah 
all of these three four nations have combined together like they they were unified together and under a single monarchy right so the same king or the same dynasty is ruling over all of these regions even if there are some other kingdoms uh, revolting or uh, invading britain britain had so much of military technology that it could easily defeat them right so overall point is britain was basically stable politically stable and militarily powerful right so um, political stability also means internally they have been prospering uh, it can be either in terms of common laws you know like the law is stable like in london the law is not in london there is no different law in manchester there is no different law but throughout england wales and scotland there is a common law just like we have the common law of constitution in india today right in the same manner britain also had a common law back in the 17th century the second one is it actually had a single currency yeah throughout all of these three regions same currency and markets are also very very prospering they are not fragmented by local authorities but instead whatever transactions were happening all of them had to pay a certain tax to the government or to the monarchy at that time right so all of these things were very very unique very um, stable and basically the monarch or the monarchy of britain have been prospering well economically politically culturally everything right uh, even the, the the currency i was talking about by the end of 17th century it has been widely used as a medium of exchange again why am i making this point because prior to 17th we had this like um, barter system like good for a good but that has been almost replaced by the exchange of money uh, or like exchange of currency as a medium of exchange right so that change has also been happening so again like what does it mean why is money so important why is exchange of money important because um let's say for example i have rice and i want to buy like toys yeah but the toy person doesn't want rice how does barter system work like i give you something you give me something deal done right but in case i want to, uh, toys and that the other person has toys to supply me but whatever he is ready to give me i don't want it in such scenarios barter system was very very difficult because you can't exchange your goods very easily with the other person in that case but if you have money like a very uni unified solid currency i could go and buy anything i want right i don't need to like match with the other person or align with the other person's interest right so in that sort of way money facilitated a wider choice of ways to spend money and to buy something from the market so that way money is important um okay a uh, preeti is here hi preeti uh yeah so what then okay that's another factor money the third one is actually agricultural revolution was taking place in england in the 18th century yeah that that can be considered as the third factor but what is agricultural revolution um again this is a whole lot of concept i'll just put it very very briefly right so let's imagine there are rich people like rich landlords within england yeah they actually have the money and the resources to buy all of the lands of the small farmers because they have the money right so in what and that is exactly what happened right because they wanted to assert their dominance they wanted to increase food production yeah they wanted to expand their land that is why they brought like they forcibly brought all of these um lands of small peasants under their control 
which means now the small peasants don't have any land with them. If they don't have the land with them, what will they do? They need, they need to live, right? They need, they need a certain source of income. If they are not cultivating or if they are not practicing agriculture because they don't have lands anymore, the only choice left with them is to leave the villages, like leave the countryside and go to some sort of town and city and settle there and look for some sort of work other than agriculture. Right? So, it's like a chain reaction. Again, I'll repeat it again. This is a little bit complicated, but you will understand it now. Yeah? What is agricultural revolution? It starts with the dominance of rich peasants, like large landholders. They are so greedy for land that they started forcibly taking away small peasants' land. Which means now small peasants don't have any land. But they need to do some sort of work to earn their livelihood. The only option left with them is to move to a city or a town and look for some other sort of work. Right? So, on one side, that is happening. On the other side, with all of the land that, they, that the large farmers have accumulated, they are performing huge estates. And because of this, what's happening is the food production has been increasing. Right? So that is why we call it as the agricultural revolution because there is lots and lots of food that is being produced now. Yes? So that's briefly the concept. But in case, um, if you all have any questions regarding this thing like agricultural revolution, please let me know. Okay, um, so till now what have we talked about? We talked about three things to justify the statement why Britain, right? So I'll just sum up the points. The first one is political stability, having a common law and stuff. The second one is the use of wide scale of currency, like a unified monetary system. The third one is agricultural revolution. So because of these three things, um, Britain has been the place or Britain has been the hub for industrial revolution, right? Um, yeah, any questions still here, guys? Uh, I know this, this was a little um, too much of information in five minutes, but uh, any questions, please let me know. Okay, uh, Piyush is here. Hi, Piyush. Okay, um, so now that's the reasons as to why Britain. Now we'll move on to another um, sub-theme, which is towns, trade and finance, right? So now what's happening in the towns, especially towns? As the title suggests, trade has been happening and also finance has been happening, right? But you also have to remember that all of these small peasants who don't have the land anymore have been coming and settling in these particular towns only. Right? Which means the people living in the town areas have been increasing. Again, which translates to the population rapidly incre increasing. Right? So... The, the phenomena that we see in towns here, especially from the 18th century, is the towns are growing in population and to accommodate these many number of people, the towns are also growing in size and area. Right? So, area and population, both of them have been growing. And just to give you like a statistical data, out of 19 European cities which were there in... Um, 1750 and 1800, right? So, I'm talking about the whole of Europe now, not just Britain, right? Whole of Europe, there were 19 cities, only 19, yeah? Population have almost been doubling in these particular uh, um, years, like in, in, within half a decade, 
the population of these 19 European cities have doubled. Surprisingly, out of these 19, 11 cities were from Britain only. Yeah, 11 cities were in Britain whose population has been doubling. So now you can imagine the population growth in Britain, right? And obviously, uh, like undoubtedly, um, out of these 11 cities in Britain also, the most famous and the largest was London, as expected. It's a hub for countries markets and following London, we have cities like Manchester, Leeds, Exeter and other cities, right? But the leading one was London. And London has in fact acquired a global significance. You go to any part of the world and ask them, do you know this particular city of London? They will definitely say yes. That's how globally prominent it was back in those times. Even now, yeah. Okay, so um, by the 18th century, there was another shift happening as to why Britain is going important. Uh, what is that? So initially what used to happen is these Mediterranean ports of Italy and France, as we have discussed in the last, last chapter, like how the Italian ports were uh, becoming important and stuff. That has been the case till 17th. But from 18th, Italy ports and France ports have been losing a lot of importance. Instead, these Atlantic coastline ports of Holland and Britain, like Holland is present day Dutch, Netherlands and stuff. Yeah. So Holland and Britain ports have been gaining a lot of importance from 18th century, which means these two places have been the hubs for global trade. So what do we see here? Flourishing of trade. Right. And another thing is London replaced Amsterdam as the principal source of loans for international trade. Again, this is a whole another economic concept, right? Like in case you don't have money to carry out trade, you borrow or take a loan from a certain uh, institution. Or that institution or bank was there in Amsterdam in the beginning. But from the 18th century, London replaced Amsterdam. Yes. So that's this slide. Um, we're still talking about London. Yeah. So London also became the city of a triangular trade network. So when I mean triangular, I basically am referring to three places. The first one is definitely England. The second is Africa and the South. And the third is West Indies towards the West of England. So it's like a triangular trade that's uh, happening. And the main base for that is London. Right. And the companies trading in America and Asia, they also had their headquarters in London or like some sort of branches in London. Right. All of these MNCs and stuff. And in England, the movement of goods between markets was held by a good network of rivers. Yeah. Because wherever you see there are some sort of rivers in England, there's a long coastline and therefore it was very easy to transport goods from one place to another. The movements of goods and in fact people was also pretty easier. Right. So um, till the railways were actually introduced, uh, again, just to make it clear to you, railways were a 19th century invention. But before that, we the only two transportation modes available to us is roadways and waterways. Yeah. Um, all of us know that waterways were much, much cheaper and also faster when compared to land, when compared to roadways. Right. So waterways was much preferred. And that is that has been happening in England by a good network of rivers. Right. And as early as 1724, yeah, we're going back to 18th century now. English rivers provided some 1,160 miles of navigable water. That's a huge uh, navigable water. Navigable water is nothing but you can make your way through that particular region in via a boat or a ship. There are no like obstructions and stuff. Right? So that that 
navigable strait has been there for almost 1160 miles yeah that's almost like 17 to 1800 kilometers um obviously within mountainous regions uh, you can't navigate your way through the river but other than the mountainous regions uh, this navigation of uh, river or waterways have been pretty much there and uh, most places in the country were within 15 miles of a river right let's say i am in a particular region if i go in any direction within 15 miles i will definitely encounter a port or some sort of river network if i want to trade from there i can trade right so there are so many centers of trading and um, since all of these navigable sections of english rivers flow into the sea right obviously like where do rivers go to finally rivers merge into the sea right because of that water flow these transportation of vehicles have been much much easier right and again there's a special sort of transportation for that called as coasters which are basically coastal ships right and we also have a statistical data by almost 1800 at least 1 lakh sailors worked on the coasters so that's how uh, widespread these uh, coasters were yeah um cool so that was um as to why london like how london has become a very very important place so we'll also look at another couple of points and uh, we'll conclude this with sub sub theme uh guys if at any point of time you feel i'm going fast or uh, you are not able to understand any concepts properly please stop me okay i don't see any questions in the chat box and therefore i'm going like from slide to slide but in case you'll have any feel free to drop in the chat box okay um the center of the country's financial system was the bank of england just like modern times for any financial transactions to take place a bank necessarily have to be there be it one bank be it 100 banks but there needs to be some sort of centralized bank and it was there in england not from 18th century but it was right from 1694 only that is a huge advancement right so we had something called as the bank of england throughout um britain scotland and wales this was the major uh, financial system surprisingly by 1784 with within like 9 decades there were more than 100 provincial banks in england that's huge right within 90 years we're basically telling 100 other different banks have been established another surprising thing during the next 10 years which is by 1794 their numbers trebled trebled is like three times like tripled that's a lot right so um, again the conclusion of all of this is by the year 1820 yeah there were more than 600 banks in the whole of england and almost 100 of these were there in london alone yes so that's the importance of um, england london the developments that have been happening in these places okay the financial requirements to establish and maintain big industrial enterprises were met by these banks yeah so what is the point i'm trying to make here again in case somebody wants to establish a firm or a company or a trading system whatever investment needs a lot of money it requires a lot of money so these banks were very very helpful in such scenarios to give out loans whenever necessary right so um we've talked about a lot till now right so i'll just sum up in a line or a two as to what all we did till now right to make things much clearer for you so the industrialization that we have been talking for a really long time for almost 50 minutes now which have been occurring in britain in uh, from 1780s to 1850s 
right? The reason as to why this industrialization is happening can be explained by certain number of factors. Yeah? What are those factors? Number one, many poor people from the villages available to work in towns, there is a lot of labor force available. For somebody to work in a bank, you need labor. You need skilled labor. That sort of skilled labor is actually available in the towns to work. Right. Secondly, bank had that ability to grant as many loans as people want and in turn industries have been set up which is again a plus thing uh, uh, which is again a benefit for the uh, England country as a whole. Right. And we also had good transportation networks via riverways and after a couple of decades railways also have been introduced. So all of these factors together are contributing to whatever has been happening in England at that time. Right? So that's like briefly summing up whatever we've done in one statement. Any questions still here, uh, please let me know. I'll take like a one minute pause for you all to type down your questions or um, clarifications, anything. We can talk about that and probably then move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, any questions, clarifications, anything guys, or if you want me to move on, then probably I can. Okay, um, I don't seem to think there are any questions. I think I can go ahead. So, um, yeah, this particular chapter that we'll talk in the next couple of sessions will describe two new things, right? The first one is a range of technological changes like invention of so much of technology and stuff, which in turn increased production levels dramatically. Let's take as simple thing as agriculture, right? There's so much of machinery, there's so much of technology and therefore the yield is also more, the production is more. In the same manner in industries also, because of machinery and stuff, uh, the quantity of goods that have been being produced has increased. And when I say increased, it's not just small increase, right? But by a huge margin, like the increased levels were very, very dramatic. Right? So that's the first factor that this chapter will talk about in detail, like what is this uh, machinery and all that stuff. The second one is a new transport network created by the construction of railways. Yeah, the prominence of railways, what did it do and stuff. We'll talk about these two things in detail in probably like day after tomorrow or something. Yeah. So we're referring to two developments now. One is uh, invention of uh, machinery, right? The second is invention of railways. So when we, we also have to be careful uh, when it comes to the dates of these inventions because invention dates and the actual usage of these items dates might be a little difficult, might be a little different. Again, what do I mean by that? For example, machines and stuff probably might have been uh, invented in 16th century only. But until late 17th and 18th centuries, machines did not gain a widespread, um, what do you say, like widespread um, uh, familiarity. Right? People didn't use it so much. Yeah. So that's what I mean by the dates are different when it comes to invention and the actual usage. Right. So, but like whatever the scenario is, once people actually started using it, um, it led to so many changes. Yeah. Like again, when I'm referring to so many changes, I'm talking about changes that are, that are happening in all the sectors, political, economic, social, everything. Right. So, um, 
within these changes also we'll be discussing four of them in detail in the next slides the first one is transformation of iron industry the second is the spinning and weaving of cotton the third is the development of steam power and the fourth is the coming of railways right so these four are actually the topics we'll be looking at in detail in um, the next um, slides again okay, please make a note of it i'm just repeating again what the four major themes are transformation of iron industry spinning and weaving of cotton development of steam power and coming of the railways right so i am hoping you all noted all of those four things down okay so the first one we'll be looking at is coal and iron right um i know it's almost like time to end the class but i'll, I'll probably do like a couple of slides of coal and iron and then i'll stop yeah okay so um again this whole part where we'll be dealing with coal and iron is a little bit uh, story format so it probably must be easier but at the same time it's also a little technical but don't worry we will break it down i'll break it down for you so um the place in england or the, the geographical location of england is rich in coal and iron ore so england basically never had a problem for raw materials because coal and iron ore or were readily available in england right they were very plenty uh, plentifully available and it's not just about coal and iron but also other minerals like lead copper tin that were used in the iron industries very frequently all of these resources are also readily available in england because the geographical terrain is as such right so it's a naturally blessed place uh however until the 18th century there was a scarcity of usable iron right so what do i mean by this uh, see all of the iron ore that is available to us honestly speaking 90% of the iron ore available to us is scrap you can't do anything with it you can't make goods out of it it's not usable right so um until the 18th century honestly speaking britain did not have that kind of usable iron it had iron ores agreed but that iron ores were not really helpful to manufacture any goods so there needs to be something done to this useless iron to become useful right so there's a lot of process involved so we will be looking at that process and the kind of people who were involved in making this process much easier okay um how many slides are left uh, i see i have a lot of slides i i've have slides for almost all, the whole of chapter but probably like i'll end after teaching three or four slides ayushi uh yeah so what is this process of making useless iron into useful iron that's the question uh the next three four slides will be talking about the same process yeah so generally iron is drawn out from ore yeah any metal in fact right whatever ores are available to us in the earth they are not red they are not for like ready made use you have to extract something out of it from the ores you have to extract the actual metal in the same manner from an iron ore iron metal has been extracted in the form of a pure liquid yeah and how do you do it by following a procedure called as smelting yeah so um that's number one step involved in this process uh aditya again as i was mentioning in the starting of the chapter probably it will take 3 to 4 sessions uh i'm not too hopeful for 3 but yeah i think it's 4 aditya because 
some in some situations like these more technical concepts are involved so we have to like go a little bit slower so that's why i think it's for aditya um yeah so the first thing the first process is smelting which is extracting iron out of an iron ore in the form of a pure liquid metal um for centuries for like before 17th century throughout history charcoal was used for the smelting process right again we are talking about smelting we are talking about smelting of iron but in order to smelt iron in the first place we need charcoal and where do we get charcoal from by burning timber timber is the bark of or like the wood of the trees right so you bring that wood like you cut down the trees you bring that wood you burn that wood and then it will become charcoal and then you use this charcoal in smelting process smelting iron that's like a huge process right um so this usage of charcoal at some point of time uh, was accompanied with a lot of problems right uh, what are these problems what are the problems in using charcoal number 1 uh, charcoal as such is a very very fragile material matlab it's weak right even if you like slowly like try to move it it will break into pieces easily right so it's too fragile and if there are situations where you have to transport it across long distances then it's obviously difficult right within the transportation process itself half of the charcoal will be gone so in that sense it's fragile and that that's why it has been a little difficult secondly its impurities produced pure quality iron charcoal is not so pure charcoal in itself means it's impure right so if you are putting all of these impurities into iron the end result will be a poor quality iron metal that is also not a good thing that's also a problem and nextly which is what is happening is um, how many trees are there for you to cut timber and burn timber at some point of time if you are continuously cutting trees there won't be any more trees to cut right so when wood is not available obviously charcoal won't be available so that the charcoal in some sense have been depleting and lastly it could not generate high temperatures right uh, charcoal does not de- generate high temperatures but for the smelting of iron we definitely need a very very high temperature so for all of these above mentioned reasons uh, charcoal was not a good um, ingredient i would say for the smelting process of iron yes so um yeah that's the slide um we'll talk about the next one now since there's a problem we obviously need a solution to this problem right it has been uh, sought for years before it was solved by a family of iron masters the darbies of shropshire again the problem persisted for a really really long time yes and finally luckily there was a solution provided yeah it's not a solution provided by one person per se but in fact it is a process of inventions or like a series of inventions invented by three different people coincidentally these three people who contributed to this invent invention are somehow related how are they related they are three generations of people belonging to the same family they are grandfather father and son coincidence right but yeah that it is what it is and um, their family name is darbies right so um, and surprisingly all of them are called as abraham darby abraham darby 1 abraham darby 2 abraham darby 3 right so um, they belong to a place called shropshire shropshire is a town in england okay right? so whatever it's whatever it is these three people have contributed a lot to solving this problem so yeah 
as I was mentioning, they are grandfather, father and son. They are all of them, all of their inventions combined together. They have brought a revolution in the metallurgical industry. Yeah. So we'll start with the first uh, Darby. Like what did he do? He actually invented whatever he did in 1709. He was called as Abraham Darby who lived within these years. You don't have to remember his uh, like when he was born and when, when he was died. But remember the year in which he invented which is 17, 1709. Yeah. So what did he invent? He actually invented a blast furnace. This is the word. It is blast furnace. Yeah. The process is, the end goal is he needs to smelt uh, iron. Right. But now instead of using charcoal, he actually started using coke. As a, as a substitute for charcoal. But what is coke? Coke is something which is derived from coal itself. Right? You somehow process coal further and that's how you get coke. Yeah? Uh, what you do is basically remove sulfur and other sorts of impurities from this coal and that's how you get coke. And coke is actually a supportive material because Coke could actually generate high temperatures unlike charcoal. So in that way, Coke has been a really, really uh, important substitute of charcoal, which helped in smelting iron. Right? Uh, yeah, they don't have to depend on charcoal anymore. So that problem is solved. And the melted iron that emerged from these furnaces permitted finer and larger castings than before. Again, the end process after smelting, whatever iron they have been getting after the process is done in the furnaces, it has been a good quality iron, like finer and larger castings have been there. Right? So overall, it's a good, uh, good invention by Abraham Dami 1. Um, so that, that's what first Abraham Dami did. Then we'll move on to second Abraham Darby, who uh, lived from 1711 to 68. So what was his contribution? His contribution to the, is that he developed wrought iron from pig iron. Right? Again, these are different uh, phases of iron smelting. Right? We have iron ore, from that we extract pig iron, from that we develop wrought iron. And then you process it to uh, manufacture some vessels or metals out of it, right? So it's like a huge process. So initially we used pig iron, like they used pig iron. Second, Darby was actually responsible for inventing something called as wrought iron, which was very l less brittle. Brittle is like delicate, right? So wrought iron is more durable. So that is also a good invention. Um, Again, before moving on to the third Darby, we look at some other inventions which happened in between, in between second and third Darby. Uh, one is Henry Cott. Henry Cott lived from 1740 to 1823. He designed the puddling furnace in which molten iron could be rid of impurities. Right? Nothing. He designed something uh, called as puddling furnaces. Yeah, here this furnace was actually used to remove impurities from the molten iron, right? And also he invented something called as a rolling mill. It's like a second invention. So what do you do with this rolling mill? This rolling mill actually uh, made iron into iron bars. It gave it a particular shape, right? And how do these work? With the use of steam power. Right? So steam power is the base here to run rolling mills, which are basically useful for uh, giving a particular shape to the iron, like a bar or square or cuboid, something. So that's the contribution of uh, Henry Cott. It now became possible to produce a broader range of iron products because obviously we have certain shapes and that's why it's easy for us to make different products. 
the durability of iron made it a better material than wood for everyday items and for machinery obviously like if you compare wood and iron iron is more durable because of its uh, chemical substances and stuff so iron was because of its durability iron was much more preferred when compared to wood right uh unlike wood which could burn or splinter the physical and chemical properties of iron could be controlled right so again fairly simple point something which we have learned in chemistry regarding a uh, chemical properties there there are some so, some sort of properties which can be reversed and which can't be reversed so when it comes to wood they are not reversible so once the wood is burnt it's burnt you can't get it back to the wooden state but iron is not like that you can smelt iron whenever you want and when it becomes a liquid again again you can transform it back to a solid state so the process is reversible right you, you have a little extra control over the material so for this reason also um iron was much more preferred than wood and in fact in the 1770s john wilkinson was actually the first person to use iron in day to day um uh, objects for example iron chairs and then we have vats for breweries and distilleries again what i mean by vats is if you look at any sort of brewer uh, brewery and stuff you have all these steel things all the pipes connected huge vessels and stuff so that's a, they are called as vats so these vats and also pipes are made up of iron so in day to day activities wilkinson was the first person to uh, make use of iron okay um okay now we come to third darby so in 1779 the third darby invented something uh, sorry he didn't invent but he made use of iron to actually build a bridge like normal bridges right bridge over a river so this bridge was actually spanning the river severn s e v e r n right it is in a place called as colebrookdale it is the world's first bridge made up of iron so that's the um importance of third darby because he was the person who constructed it right um wilkinson used cast iron for the first time to make water pipes um again all all the usages right the same wilkinson we have talked about in the last slide the iron industry then came to be concentrated in specific regions as integrated units of coal mining and iron smelting again if you are calling something as an iron industry it needs two things firstly you need coal because in order to melt iron you need coke which is a substitute of coal so coal mining is happening on one side then we also have a certain factory besi just beside that coal mining which is used for iron smelting and together it is called as iron industry right so in different places in britain this iron industry have been coming up in various places right um britain was obviously lucky in possessing excellent coking coal and high grade iron ore in the same basins or even the same seams again geographically gifted it's it's not something that man created right it's a uh, nature's gift geographically gifted um another important thing is these basins where these uh, coke and uh, iron or raw materials are available they are very very close to the ports yeah and when i mean they are close to the ports they are so close that the products directly from these uh, sites like these basins they were directly shipped um, ported to the ships right so you don't need some sort of van or a bullock cart or something else to transport the material instead from the site itself this material was material was directly loaded into the ship they were that close right so that is also a added benefit no transportation charges um with this i'll end this today's class last slide for today guys 
So, um, since the coal fields were near the coast, shipbuilding increased, as did the shipping trade, right? Because if something is near to the port and if there is ship ship facility available, people would obviously prefer waterways only instead of roadways. Anyways, waterways are cheaper. Anyways, they are faster. So, added to that, they are very close. So, obviously, um, shipping and shipbuilding industries have also um, fl flourished. Uh, nextly, the Britain, uh, the British iron industry quadrupled its output. Quadrupled is like four times, like multiplied by four times uh, between 1800 and 1830 and its products were the cheapest in Europe. Right? Like if you're producing so much, if there's so much of supply available, obviously the price will be lesser. Right? So Britain has been benefiting in a lot of ways. Um, again, just to give you like another stat, in the year 1820, a ton of pig iron needed 8 tons of coal to make it, right? So again, what I mean by that is in order to smelt a, a ton of pig iron, you needed 8 tons of coal. That's like so much coal, 8 times the actual product. But at but if you move to 1850, there was so much technological development that instead of 8, now only 2 tons of coal are needed to cast or to smelt this iron. That's a huge technological development. In that way, you're also saving coal. Right? Uh, by 1848, Britain was smelting more iron than the rest of the world put together. Fairly understandable point. So, um, yeah, that's all we have for today. Oh God, it's 7.17. Uh, we ran like 17 minutes past time, but it's okay because we have um, not finished the entirety of it. Uh, in the next class, we'll talk about cotton spinning and weaving, right? But for now, we only talked about coal and iron, which is a very important uh, part of this chapter. So I'm hoping everybody understood. In case there are questions, please let me know. Um, but yeah, uh, keep typing down your questions if you all have any guys. In the meanwhile, I'll try to um, wind this chapter up. Sorry, wind the class up. So um, again, guys, there's something called as Bugs Bounty, which is an academy special feature. It's basically an opportunity for you learners to report any sort of inappropriate content. You can be the first one to report that particular issue and claim a prize for that. You can do that by uh, filling the form in the description below of this video. And there's a special offer going on for plus subscriptions. If you want to uh, avail it, it's a limited offer. Uh, do it quickly, guys. And yeah, finally, uh, thank you. Thanks so much for staying back even after the class uh, timings got over. Uh, I highly appreciate it guys. Thanks so much. And yeah, if you like the content of these videos, please do like it, share it as much as possible and also subscribe to the channel on Academy. Thanks guys. Uh, just to give you a heads up before leaving, we actually have a class tomorrow, which is Sunday. I know it's a Sunday, but I wanted to finish this chapter. So it's Sunday, 11 a.m. Yeah, so it's a morning class. So I'll see you soon tomorrow. Okay, the class is officially over. In case anybody wants to leave, um, you all can. But in case anybody has questions, just stay back. I'll answer them and then we can close. Okay, I don't think there are any questions, uh, therefore I'll wind this up. Um, thanks guys. Um, bye everyone. Uh, bye Ayushi. Uh, but yeah, just a reminder, tomorrow class uh, at 11 a.m. where we'll continue this chapter. right? So I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow and till then take care and uh, bye. Have a good evening.